Hello, hello. Welcome back to Peak Northwest, an outdoors and travel podcast by The Oregonian and Oregon Live, dedicated to the adventure and exploration of our beautiful Pacific Northwest. I'm Jamie Hale. And I'm Vicki Connor. Together, we take you to some of the most beautiful and interesting destinations in our region, discussing where to go, what to do, and places to see. And today, we are talking about an outdoor activity that I, frankly, am very jealous that you got to do, Jamie. <laughs> uh, and that is dog sledding in Oregon's Central Cascade Mountains. Vicki, I, I knew this would be right up your alley. Uh, and it's true. Um, this winter uh, in February, I drove out to Mount Bachelor, which is just outside of Bend. And instead of spending a day on the slopes, because that's not really my thing, uh, I signed up for a dog sled ride, which is, in fact, a real thing that you can do. I had no idea that, you know, it was something you could just kind of sign up for, you know, pay to do. Uh, and that... I'm assuming this is something that's open to the public. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we talk about like winter activities in Oregon. You hear about skiing, cross-country skiing, uh, snowshoeing, even skijoring. And you're like, wow, you're really getting crazy with skijoring. Mm -hmm. But you can get a dog sled ride. Um, that is something that you have to pay money that some experienced mushers will take you on. Um, and it's not something you can do everywhere. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of places do it, but Mount Bachelor has partnered up with this organization called Oregon Trail of Dreams, which is run by this father-daughter team of super experienced mushers who will take people on the on a regular basis out on a short one-hour dog sled ride around the snowy forests at Mount Bachelor. Oh my goodness. Oh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> Um, I like, I need to know every single detail about this. Um, first off, do you have to go at a certain time? Like when trail conditions are a certain way, how does that work? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know specifically when the season is like, you don't need like a ton of snow to do it. You're not necessarily looking for like powder to do dog sled rides, but you got to have snow on the trails. Right. So, um, basically when Mount Bachelor is operating its winter season, they will operate these dog sled rides as well. Um, so there's, there's only, they only do a few rides, um, you know, a day and not every day of the week, but so you've got, you kind of have to like schedule your time to do it. Um, so it's, you know, they have a certain number of time slots that you can sign up for and you get like your one hour ride in that time frame. So that's kind of the, 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 the way to do it. Um, and as with everything else, weekdays are better than weekends. Um, but as, as far as I saw, it's not like the most competitive thing in the world to try to sign up for. Obviously, holiday weekends, anytime when the, the ski area is going to be slamming, these are probably going to be full. But any other time, you know, midweek or, you know, um, something like that is a great time to go do it. Okay, let's get into this. So to tell me what this setup is like. How many dogs are there? Okay, well, let me just say I I started this by parking at the parking lot at the Sunrise Lodge, which is one of the two lodges there at Mount Bachelor. And uh, they had just said like, oh, the, the sled dog rides leave from an area beside the parking lot. And so I get out of my car and I'm walking around and I'm looking for like signs. I'm not seeing any signs. And I'm not really sure where to go or what to do. And I was about to go in and ask someone when I heard like this, like sound, this very loud sound coming from over on the far side of the parking lot. It was sounded like the squawking of like a flock of seagulls, just like this really high pitch sort of like, rah, 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 rah. and I was like, that's, that's gotta be what I'm looking for. That's gotta be the dogs. And so I walked over there and sure enough, there were, uh, like, a a, a string of, I, I don't even know, two dozen, maybe three dozen dogs, um, all just like so amped, jumping up in the air, snapping their jaws, playing with each other, like <laughs> screaming, like it was so loud. They were so excited to be there out in the snow. And they were like, you know, uh, leashed up like one at a time along this sort of like string. And then there were, uh, there's a pair of sleds and a number of mushers. And the mushers were like getting the dogs attached in harnesses to the sleds. So the way they do it is eight dogs to the sled. At least that was my sled. Um, and they pick the dogs based on like, you know, the number of people, the weight, the experience. They like assemble these dog teams that are going to work well together for this certain 
experience that you're going in for. So I got there, I met up with my musher and, um, you know, he was like, he was great. Um, he was this like, you know, um, sort of taller bearded man, um, named Joey Stancato. Um, he's like an artist and musician, but also a musher. And he had me sign a waiver. Um, they went over this like safety lesson and, you know, we, I jumped in the sled and when everything was situated with all eight dogs harnessed the sled, like the moment I like got in, he just said like, let's go hop hop. And the dogs just <laughs> took off <laughs> just at a, at a run, all eight of them. And just like rocketed the sled forward down this like snowy hill and into the forest. <laughs> And as soon as I got into the forest, it was silence. It was the craziest thing. Cause I, I mean, on that hill, it's just like when they're harnessing the dogs, they were all like snapping at their jaws and yelping and barking and crazy. Mm -hmm. But as soon as they were like doing that thing that they like to do, they were in the zone. Mm -hmm. And it was just like the sudden silence of the forest. And Joey leaned over to me because he was, he was standing behind me driving the sleigh. And he said, listen to that silence. And I was like, yeah. That's wild. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I guess to paint a picture a little bit more for people who I assume have never gone dog sledding before, just like me. So like you said, the musher is standing behind you and you are sitting inside of the sled. That's right. Yeah, exactly. It's like um, if you sort of imagine kind of a sort of a looser, maybe sort of, um, you know, water protected canvas sack, if you will, um, that's kind of like <laughs> you're kind of sitting in this like little in this little sack and you're kind of, you know, that's sort of attached to the frame of the sled. And the musher is standing on the back of the sled on with a foot on either of these two footboards, which jut out from the base of the sled on either side. And he's holding onto this handlebar on the back. And the dogs, of course, are harnessed, harnessed to the front of the sled, pulling it. So you're kind of sunk down, you know, in it a little bit. And, um, you know, he was up behind me commanding the dogs. And we were just zooming right ahead down this trail. Gosh. <laughs> so that initial takeoff, were you like, oh, hold on. <laughs> were you, did you like fly back at all? Or you were like securely in this thing? I was, I was pretty <laughs> snug in there. But I was like, I definitely was not expecting to take off that quickly. I should have. It felt like the beginning of a roller coaster. Like those, those ones that just like you take off really quickly right away. It was like that. Mm -hmm. um, no long build up to it. Um, it was, it was just a, a just. A, a rocket right out of the gate. But from once, once we got on the trail, then it was just sort of nice and serene, kind of just gliding along, yeah. almost just kind of like flying, you know, just gliding through the trail. Um, the dogs know the trail so well. So like, you're just kind of along for their ride, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when I think of dog sledding, I'm thinking of like a pack of huskies leading the way, or those the dogs. <laughs> well, this is interesting. So I, I I was also expecting like the classic like Siberian husky with like the the puffy fur and like the black and white. Um, that is not what you normally are going to see dog sledding, at least these days. Um, like with dog owners of all kinds, they breed dogs specifically to do this task. And what is known as the Alaskan Husky is not a breed of dog. It's a category of dog that is crossbred from a bunch of different kinds of breed. So you'll see, you know, sometimes it is a Siberian Husky mix. Sometimes it's like a Greyhound. Sometimes it's like a German short-haired pointer. Um, these dogs looked more like a pointer to me. Um, you know, that kind of a dog as opposed to the big fluffy, um, you know, Husky of a dog that we're used to thinking. So you know, if I'd seen this dog at a dog park, I wouldn't think too much of it. I wouldn't think like, oh, that's a dog sledding dog. Um, but for reasons that I don't quite understand, um, these dogs are like prime for this particular task. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so how far did you go? You know, it was interesting. The The mileage is, is hard to say. It was about a 45 minute ride in all with a couple starts and stops. Um, but it, it flew by. It, it went so fast. And that's something that Joey told me when he was, you know, as he was driving the sled, he was like, you know, you, it, you really kind of get into a time warp sometimes with these because, you know, you, 
you're going at a certain speed that you're not used to going. Um, you're kind of in it with the dogs and, you know, we went like a mile and he's like, did you know we went a mile in like that short period of time? And I was like, no, I had no idea. Um, you, you just really go. So we kind of went and did this little lollipop loop, um, turned around and came back the same up the same trail. And about halfway through that ride, he said like we took it, we stopped with the dogs and he said, so do you want to, do you want to, you want to try standing on the back? Oh, and I was like, and my first reaction was, was no, I don't. But I was like, <laughs> he's saying it's cool. I'm sure it's cool. I'm sure people do this. I'm sure it's fine. Um, so we got to a point when we stopped and he and I changed places. I got out of the sled and I stepped on the footboards in the back and I held on to the handle and he got in the sled and he pulled up the, like the, the, this like, you know, anchor basically that holds the sled down so the dogs don't pull it off. And he was like, all right, tell him to go. <laughs> I was like, so I, I did what he did early on and I tried like the, you know, like the let's go hop, hop. And the dogs did nothing. <laughs> they just did not respond. They didn't seem to notice. And he's like, well, it's okay. Try it with maybe like a little bit more, you know, a little bit more. And I was trying to like put some oomph into it, put a little bark into it. I'm not a dog owner. I don't know how to work with dogs. And they, they know that. They must know that. So I, it was like when I did horseback riding and they were like, you really have to like command the horse. You really have to, you know, be sharp with it and kick it in the sides. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. Um, it's an animal, <laughs> but that's what you have to do. Um, I, you know, I, I'm used to cats where you don't yell at them or you don't have to like command them with authority. And so I, I think I would just, I didn't have the right personality for it, but eventually with some like nudging of the sled, with my body weight, they got the message of like, oh, we're going now. And they took off mm. and we went. And once I was like, once I, once they were running and I was standing back there, I got to say it was really cool. Uh, it, then it really did feel like flying, just like standing there without having like to exert any energy and just moving through this like snowy forest. It was so cool. Did you have to give them any other commands other than that like go command? Uh, no, he, he managed to get them to stop. Um, I don't remember him giving any specific command to, to get them to stop. He did. I think there's like a, a break mm -hmm. you can use, um, on the sled that like, kind of gets them to, to slow down. And they also sometimes would just sort of slow down anyway, like going uphill, they slow down a little bit, obviously. And I think you can kind of just be like, you know, you can kind of just get them to stop naturally that way as well. Um, I did not need to, they would just stop. Um, because they were like not having me or something. And, uh, Joey and I eventually mm -hmm. switched places, got back in, I got back in and we finished off the ride going uphill, but he mostly just, you know, he, he says, you just kind of have to just bark at them basically. And that hup hup is sort of like him barking at them to say like, go do your thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's time to go off and run. <laughs> well, going off of that was the trail you mentioned some some ups some downs was it a good combination of the two? It was mostly flat, I'd say. Uh mostly downhill. Okay. And then mostly uphill coming back. But most of it I'd say was pretty flat. Uh there was um, some parts that passed this a nice clearing where you could get a really good look at the mountain. That was pretty nice and we we slowed mm -hmm. down and stopped there at one point. Um so that was pretty cool. Uh, but otherwise, it was mostly just a sort of a flat forested trail um, with lots of uh, lots of just sort of nice, quiet scenery. Oh, my gosh. At the end, were the dogs like pretty tuckered out? Were they just wanting to go, go, go? They they could have gone for Because I know my dog would not be. <laughs> they were they were like, they, I mean, they were champing at the bit the whole time. So the, the background here is that the, so the company that runs the, all of this Oregon trail of dreams is, is like I said, run by these two mushers, father and daughter, mostly now run by the daughter, whose name is Rachel Skadoris. And Rachel Skadoris is, um, like a, a very well accomplished musher. So she has run the Iditarod four times and she has completed it twice, which is really cool. She's also the only, she was the first legally blind person to ever complete the Iditarod. So wow. she is, she knows what she's doing, right? These are not inexperienced people doing these dog sled rides. These are like hardcore, um, professionals. So Rachel has, um, she told me 
95 dogs that she lives with. 95 dogs. Lives with? <laughs> she lives with. <laughs> um, and I was, I was pretty shocked at that number of dogs because like the idea of living with one dog is a lot to me let alone 95, but she said that that includes 77 working dogs or, you know, sled, sled dogs, um, 13 puppies and five retirees. So just oh wrap your mind gosh. around living with that many dogs. Um, she obviously does not live in like the city of Bend, like in a house. She has like property <laughs> out with the ranchers and the farmland where she has all of these dogs. Um, but she, you know, raises these teams to go compete in the, in these various competitions and to, to take on these commercial sled dog rides. And, you know, she was talking about just the way you have to sort of build a team like that. Some people think I'll go buy some dogs and we can just go run. And she's like, no, you can't like, you, you need to like get some experienced older dogs to teach your younger dogs. And over time you build a team that you can trust and a team that trusts you. And that element of trust is so important. She said, in doing dog sledding. And something uh, that I saw even on my quick one hour ride, the fact that Joey didn't have to give them like hardly any commands was fascinating. He didn't have to drive them and tell them where to go. The dogs, like, you know, if you, if what Rachel said is if a dog runs a trail once, it knows it forever. They just have that kind of instinctual awareness. Um, so these dogs mm -hmm. just are running their little course, um, having their fun, and you just let them go. So what Rachel was telling me is like, she's like, you know, I, I trust the dogs to, to do that and to do, you know, to do a good job and to listen to me and the dogs trust me to not get them into anything that they can't handle. And that's, that's really kind of beautiful yeah. relationship you have to have with these animals in order to do this kind of work. So it, it's not just doing a dog sled ride. It was like being introduced into the whole world of dog sleds in general and mushing and it is way more complex than i i ever imagined yeah and it, i imagine it was pretty cool to see these dogs in like almost this innate element of <laughs> i am out in the wild and i am running and i am like doing a task um and not sitting on the couch with my human <laughs> yeah the the they were so psyched i cannot cannot overemphasize how excited they were to do this. Like, you know, they were leaping off the ground, like several feet off the ground. <laughs> the pictures I got of the dogs as they were about to go is crazy. Just like snapping their jaws in the air and just like going, going absolutely nuts for this. Um, so they, this is, yeah, this is their happy place. And it felt like just a privilege just to get to be there with them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So overall, how would you rate your your experience with this? Did it live up to the, any expectations that you had, Jamie? You know, I, I tried to go in with no expectations at all, but I, I will say I rated this very highly. I thought it was a very cool experience. Um, that said, this is something that is not, um, it's not cheap. It's not, you know, the cheapest thing to do when it comes to outdoor recreation. So the trips usually cost like 225 to $310 per adults or like 110 to 210 per child. And those prices change on like, you know, the, the day and the season you're doing it. Um, but those align with roughly like a three day lift ticket at Mount Bachelor. So this is a one hour dog sled ride versus like three days of skiing at Mount Bachelor. That's a very different kind of experience. But what Rachel said is some people, you know, save up their whole lives for this. And this is like a bucket list thing they've always wanted to do. And some people, who have more means just stumbled across it and they're like, well, this would be a fun thing to try. Um, either way, she said, everyone leaves with the same feeling of joy um, at, at being there with yeah. the dogs at, you know, going, having this experience as a dog owner, Vicky, as I'm sure, you know, that like joy of dogs is really contagious and seeing them so happy makes you feel so happy. And that's something I picked up on there for sure. So just getting to be there with them, like I said, was absolutely worth it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with that many dogs, that's a lot of dog food you have to buy too. <laughs> so I'm sure it helps offset the cost. You know, I, sometimes I wonder when I look at my dog, just laying on the couch, not paying rent, <laughs> I'm like, Hmm, how are you going to earn your keep? Maybe 
you should become a sled dog. I'm just kidding. But uh, yeah, that, what a cool experience. And oh my gosh, I'm going to start saving my money to do it. Yeah. <laughs> because oh my God, I feel like I would just be like, have the craziest smile on my face the entire time. I would love it. <laughs> well, I should say that this, while the, these one hour trips is what um, Oregon Trail of Dreams mostly does, they also do a four hour excursion out to nearby Elk Lake, which is close to Mount Bachelor. And you go two hours out there, you have lunch at Elk Lake, they give you lunch, and then you do two hours back. And that's about $1,200 for two people, obviously a little bit more. Wow. But, um, yeah. you know, if you're looking for like a truly epic dog sled experience, that is like the cream of the crop as far as a tourism experience goes. Um, obviously, the yeah. Iditarod... Much different story. You can get a lot more dog sledding in that way. But, you know, if you don't want, don't want to do any of the training, don't want to own 95 dogs, <laughs> you can go ahead and <laughs> hop in a sled at Mount Bachelor and have a quick experience in this world. Well, Jamie, I did not know that this experience was even available. I mean, maybe in Alaska or something. I did not know that it was something so accessible to the Portland area. So I am so stoked to learn about this. Yeah. Well, for folks who want to try it out, you can head to Mount Bachelor's website. And under like winter activities, you can just click on dog sled rides and book one there for your next trip out there. Um, very cool thing to do. Um, family friendly. Uh, you can take, you know, kids, anyone, um, and have a nice time out there. Uh, last question. Do you have to book it pretty far in advance or is it something where you can book at any time? I think it's just like anything else where the earlier you book it, the safer it is. Um, but you know, I want to say I booked mine two weeks in advance and mm -hmm. had, there were plenty of slots available that day. Um, so it's not something you really have to like six months out in advance, unless you want to do one again for these really popular times. If you're trying to go for holiday weekend, book it far in advance. But if you're just looking to do it, trying to find a time to do it, um, you should be able to find one, no problem. Amazing. Well, if not this year, I will save my money for next year and I'm going to get out there with those dogs. Nice. I'm excited to hear back from you, Vicky, about this experience because I know you're going to like it. I, I know it's... I know you're going to love it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that will wrap things up for today. But folks, until next time, you can watch all of our videos on the Oregonians YouTube channel and view all of our travel and outdoors coverage on OregonLive.com slash travel, as well as HereIsOregon.com. Please leave us a rating or review if you enjoy the show. And if you want to support this podcast as well as our local journalism, please consider a subscription to Oregon Live. You can find details at OregonLive.com slash pod support. Also, if you're a fan of the show and you are interested in potentially sponsoring it, you can get in touch with our marketing people at advertise at Oregonian.com. This episode of the show was produced by me, Vicki Connor, alongside Jamie Hale, Andrew Thien, and Elena Neal Sachs. Stay safe and happy travels, everyone. Until next time, we leave you with this 10 seconds of Zen.